is News Talk. Now, you're very welcome back. Happy to say Gary Murphy, Professor of Politics at DCU, is with us, author as well of Hahi, new biography of Charles Hahi. I'm sure lots of people are digging into it. It was in many a uh, Christmas stocking over the festive period. Gary, great to have you on. How are you doing? Good, Joe. Thanks for having me. No, super to have you. We haven't talked too much about Hahi on the show previously. <laughs> I wouldn't have thought so, no. <laughs> So I'll tell you, I mean, maybe the best place to jump off is almost uh, the genesis of this piece. So we, we were just chatting Christmas, a few of us, and it was noted that your book was out and how oh, he's a fascinating figure in so many ways. And we remember 1987 and Stephen Roach and we remember Italia mm. 90 and him marching around the stadium. And I suppose we thought, oh, yeah, there's a there's a hockey sport thing there. Clearly, he was shrewd enough to understand the power of sport and associating with success. But beyond that, we didn't know uh, too much about Hahi. So it seems, uh, having looked at uh, some of the work that you've done, it's not that Hahi had no interest in sport and this was cynical in the, the extreme. If you go back to his early years, Hahi was into his sport and into his GAA in particular. Oh, yeah, he was um, he was a very serious uh, sportsman as a, uh, uh, well, first of all, as a young boy in, um, in his primary school in Marino, um, he... Uh, he was part of a, um, a double winning team in 1937 of the, uh, the Dublin Junior Ch- uh, Primary Schools Championship. Um, and when he went to secondary school, then he, he got a Dublin Corporation scholarship uh, in 1938. He went to Joey's, the famous Joey's in Fairview, uh, where he was again a very uh, good player. Uh, he played corner forward um, mostly for the hurling team and sort of wing forward, half forward for the uh, for the football team. Uh, he was beaten um, in Leinster College's finals in both hurling and football uh, in 43, uh, which was a terrible disappointment uh, to him. So basically his leaving cert uh, year. And, um, and he came from a distinguished sporting family. His brother, Sean, uh, was a very good uh, soccer player. Uh, he played at a number of Dublin clubs, most uh, famously Shelburne. And his younger brother, Jock Porek, sometimes known as Jock, uh, he won an All-Ireland football medal in 1958. He was part of the uh, the Dublin team that beat Derry in the 58 uh, football final. Um, so they were uh, they were a distinguished sporting family. His father, Johnny Haw, he was... Uh, uh, he was in the army. He was, to use the word at the time, Joe, he was invalided out of the army in 1928. But he was a very good um, horseman. And how his love of horses, um, which was lifelong, does come from uh, his father. He, his own children were, were both distinguished uh, horse people, or two of his children, Emer and uh, and Connor, who represented Ireland uh, uh, in show jumping in um, in youths competition. So there is a there is a sporting lineage uh, to the to the Hawhey family, certainly. Right, okay. Am I right in saying, Gary, he was suspended from the GEA for a year? He had a temper. Yeah, he did. He he, he had a rather odd um, a club a career. He basically, he was Vincent's were the, were the, were the hockey's uh, club. Uh, they all played with, with Vincent's. But how he transferred uh, to Parnell's um, in um, just as he had left college. So basically, just as he was becoming uh, an, an, an adult player, I suppose. Um, you know, I, I, I was... Uh, I was used to their sort of transfer rule in, um, in GA where people couldn't transfer for, for years from one parish uh, to the next. But uh, uh, Paul Rose told me that there was no no parish rule in uh, in Dublin. And for reasons that are slightly unclear, but I think are to do with uh, with, with his friends, uh, how he transferred to uh, to Parnell's um, and got involved basically in, uh, in in a fight on the pitch and struck a linesman. Uh, for uh, in, a, in a, basically in a league match, uh, was sent off, suspended for a year, but never played. Uh, never played again. This was the way he would have been in his sort of early to mid twenties, and um, kind of making his way in Dublin uh, society. And uh, he decided that uh, the GA was no longer for him. But he he had a lifelong interest in the um, in the GA. I mean, he went to Croke Park quite a lot. As a as a senior politician, uh, he would have went to uh, we would have went to All Ireland finals, uh, semi finals. Um, Kerry the Kerry teams of Mick O'Dwyer famously, uh, when they won, would go to uh, Abbeville the day after um, their uh, their victory. So in the eighties um, and the four in a row team from I think seventy eight to eighty one, uh, they would have went to Abbeville and there would have been a bit of a a uh, bit of a brew high, I suppose. Um, so now where the where the Dublin going out the boar's head? Well, in the old days, Kerry, you certainly go to uh, uh, to Abbeville, and there are letters in Hockey's archive. Um, there's one very nice one to uh, to Mick O'Dwyer in '82, where Hockey sympathises on uh, 
and Kerry just famous, famously yeah. coming up uh, short. So he, he, you know. So was was Hahi, uh, was was Hahi a Kerry supporter more than a Dublin supporter then? Well, no, no, I wouldn't say he was that. He was uh, he was a strong Dublin supporter, but I think he, he certainly had a, a love of of Kerry football, much to my own uh, chagrin, being from the uh, the Rebel County next door and having growing up uh, at the punishment Jimmy Barry Murphy and others would have got from those from Paul O'Shea and Jimmy Dean and, uh, and the like. But how he did have, you know, he obviously had the island in his fickle lawn. Yeah. Uh, Dingle was close to his heart, and uh, he certainly had a soft spot for. Um, for Kerry football and uh, and was friendly, very friendly with uh, with Paddy O'Shea in particular in uh, in later years. Okay, and so if the Dubs happened to win in All Ireland around that time, I'm thinking of Hefo's Army. Maybe we uh, or he would have had Abbeville then. Would they have been invited but, for a booze up on the Monday? No, I think it was just a Kerry thing. Right. Um, uh, as far as I know, Joe. Huh. But he um, but he did have a genuine love of, of sport um, and a love of the GA. And uh, conversely, then uh, he never. Unlike his father-in-law, Sean Lamass, he would never go to the Lansdowne Road for rugby. Uh, rugby just wasn't his sport. He, you know, he would have been invited uh, when he was T-shirt to all the sort of the, the home Five Nations. They would have been, or even Four Nations in those days. Um, internationals. Uh, he never went. Rugby simply wasn't his uh, his sport. There certainly was probably a north side, south side thing. Um, how he had proud north side roots, roots as uh, as you know. Uh, but no, he uh, rugby wasn't his thing. But uh, and soccer not particularly either. Although as I said, his brother Sean was a very good player. Um, but famous that you did have, of course, Italia and uh, ninety. Yeah. Um, but I, I would say, you know, to sum him up in terms of sport, he 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 did have a genuine interest in uh, uh, in sport, like uh, well, like many Irish people have. Mm. So, 1987, at this stage, he's very much in office and he's a huge figure in Irish politics and he recognises when Stephen Roche is on the cusp of winning the Tour de France, quite clearly, he recognises the opportunity this is for him. I suppose the extraordinary thing here is it's one thing welcoming somebody home from off the plane at Dublin Airport or it's one thing maybe turning up in Paris in some capacity. I mean, he does end up on the podium. It's worth it's worth re- <laughs> it's worth restating <laughs> that. Do you know what I mean? Like it's yeah, it's I Roach do, and Hahi on the podium. Yeah, it's an extraordinary uh, story, and there's a photo in the book of, of that uh, uh, of Roach Hockey. Um He was friendly, of course, with uh, with Mitterrand. Uh, very friendly with Mitterrand, and Mitterrand had been a guest of his in the uh, on the island in Uh They were they were close contemporaries, and um, yeah. And, and he, the other thing is, he goes over and back into one day. I mean, he basically they fly over in the government jet. Uh, he goes down to the, the Champs Elysees. He gets on the podium, and he literally flies uh, flies back. No, his his rationale for this was that uh, this was a, a momentous sporting event. I mean, Roach in the middle of his great uh, wins, both in the Giro d'Italia and later in the World uh, uh, Cycling Championships. But to win the Tour de France was, you know, unheard of for a uh, uh, for, for a, an Irish cyclist. So it was, uh, I think how he saw the sort of the grandeur of it. Uh, he certainly loved France and he would take, you know, many opportunities uh, to go there. Uh, and these things kind of came together for him. And he... Um, uh, but so, so so while the cynic would say, yeah, you know, how he was kind of going on the bandwagon of of Roach's great uh, uh, success, he would have seen it as paying due regard as the head of the Irish uh, state um, mm. uh, to 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 go. I mean, it's sort of fanciful in one way to to think of of a tea shop, but it was it was a Sunday. Uh, you know, he probably didn't have a lot on in terms of uh, a politics a Sunday in in July. I think I remember I was actually down the park watching. Uh, Cork and Kerry in the Munster final um, the day Mike Kishi got the late goal and you know Cork come back to equalise and then they finally beat uh, Kerry and there was a big announcement Stephen Roach has won uh, the Tour de France I remember the big cheer at half time um, so a Sunday in July he probably thought he had nothing um, nothing better to do and uh, and the, the papers the following day then are full of his uh, of his, his his appearance on the uh, on the podium Yeah I'll bet and you know they're images which really endure you know and I suppose in 87, the economy is in such a dark place still. I'm sure at that point he's trying to get it moving. You'd have memories of that. It's a lived experience. But I mean, everything I know about it is that the economy was still in such a dreadful place. This, oh, yeah. uh, cynically or otherwise, this is a way to change the self-image of Ireland, change the conversation, if only for a few days. Well, indeed. I mean, yeah, the 87 was, you know, he he, he wins the 87 uh, election. He doesn't get an overall 
a majority, much to his sort of own uh, own chagrin. He, he comes up a couple of seats short. Uh, there is a talent strategy with uh, with Alan Jukes and um, and the economy. He like he the beginnings of social partnership. You know, he, he tries a lot in terms of foreign direct investment. He's always flying off, to, you know, to Japan and places in the United States, trying to drum up uh, business for Ireland Inc. I suppose one might say. Um, uh, but he, you know, he had a um, his summer times. He did like to um, to relax. Uh, you know, he sailed a lot. Uh, he would go to the island in, in his Ficklaw mostly for August. And so in, with the Tour de France, certainly um, the opening up of the sort of the Irish uh, economy and uh, Ireland to the world uh, and wrote, and I remember this is a Tour de France was a global event. Um, it used to be shown, I think, on Channel 4 in the in those days. And, uh, and I think the extraordinary success of Roach, also Roach being from Dublin, I think, uh, you know, that would have appealed to hockey as well. So um, I think all these things came together and uh, off uh, off he went. Yeah, it was a no-brainer. And so then in Italia 90, as I understand it, Ireland had the presidency of the EU and he was in Dublin Castle for the Romania penalty shootout. He was, yeah. And this is a, f- a kind of famous moment. This is where he dances a jig in the courtyard. Apparently so, yeah. So basically the, the, the presidency of the EU is uh, a six-monthly event and Ireland have it from January until uh, until June. And it was spoke how he had a, quite an environmental streak to him and the idea was this would be the sort of the, the green presidency. Uh, as it turned out, the great event was the, uh, the fall of the Berlin Wall just the previous November and German unification was a big, huge, uh, huge deal, and the presidency became sort of dominated by that, uh, uh, by that issue. So by June, there's a final uh, meeting of all the uh, uh, all the prime ministers. So people like uh, Papandreou in Greece, uh, Helmut Kohl Germany, uh, Mitterrand, um, uh, Andriotti in Italy, Margaret Thatcher, uh, Britain. They all come together in uh, in June. Uh, there's a big meeting, and it's during. You know when when the country is sort of uh, in the middle of uh, of World Cup uh, uh, fever. Um, that was on the Monday um, when Ireland beat uh, Romania on uh, on penalties in the in the last sixteen uh, of the World Cup. Um, there's the, there's there's a meeting in Dublin Castle. Uh, the business kind of stops. Uh, for that meeting, um, you know, there, there, obviously there's there's famous footage on reading in the ears of you know journalists crying and whatnot, and uh, and how he was genuinely delighted, and so much so that he then decided to uh, to go to Italy and to go to Rome uh, for the quarter final. Now I, I write in the book that um, President Hillary. Um, Another football fan uh, wanted to go, uh, but Hockey certainly wasn't let. Uh, Hillary steal the limelight, and uh, and he went to um, to Rome to uh, to see Scalacci score that uh, that famous goal that uh, doomed us to uh, uh, to to defeat. There's again, there's a picture in the book of him uh, literally wandering around the uh, the stadium with the tricolor uh, in his arms uh, when the. Uh, uh, when when the team are taking their sort of uh, lap of honour, mm. uh, there's a kind of a funny story told afterwards uh, of uh, Tony Cascarino saying to Anthony Tones, "And who's this guy in the uh, uh, in the dressing room?" And Tones and apparently says it's the tea shop, and Cascarino replies, uh, "Tea shop? What's a guy who who owns a tea shop yeah. doing in our dressing room?" I, I've heard that. I desperately so, hope yeah, it's true. That one, yeah. I desperately I hope, hope it's true. It's true. It, it does have the sort of ring of truth about <laughs> it. So, if, uh, but he. Um, but yeah, I mean, again, in Italia 90, it's sort of a great uh, global uh, event. I mean, it, it dominated, uh, uh, you know, Irish life for, the, for, for that month in, uh, uh, in late May, early uh, June. And, uh, and how he was very attuned to that. Hmm. I mean, it does speak of his ego as well. There's, there's celebrating Roach and there's uh, celebrating Italia 90 and there's turning up on the podium with Roach and taking the lap of honour in with the team with a giant tricolour. I mean... He wasn't shy here about claiming uh, oh, no. this and moment. He, he is, like no, he gives an insight all. into him as a personality. Oh, very much so. I mean, like how he didn't uh, he didn't have self confidence issues, <laughs> um, uh, to put it mildly. Um, but he thought that you know, I mean, there's some talk of uh, you know, Fianna Fáil doing very well in the polls in the uh, in the summer of uh, of 1990. But how he was, I think, realistic enough to know that. Being associated with such events was a pretty ephemeral politically. I mean, within a few months, uh, his uh, his Taoiseach ship takes a tremendous uh, a dent when um, when the presidential election of November 1990 is held, and uh, and his candidate Fianna Fáil candidate Brian Lenihan is embroiled in all sorts of controversy. Uh, another actually very 
man very interested in sport and a very good soccer player, Linehan mm. was. Uh, and, uh, you know, and uh, that sort of the beginning of the end uh, of hockey. So um, yeah. I, I, I don't buy this sort of thing. You know, hockey was doing this sort of as uh, to gain, uh, you know, political favour with the uh, with the masses. But it certainly didn't it didn't do him any harm. In, do you in not? The Jeez, I, I, that's, that's really interesting because, it, look, maybe cynically, we've just seen it for the 30 years since. I would yeah. say it was an unashamed and absolutely conscious effort to just be associated with winners and to be popular and to, you know, always be politicking. I I, I, I would have it as at 95% that and 5%, well, these are great Irish people doing things on an international stage and it's only right and proper that I'm there to acknowledge that and celebrate that. I mean, you mentioned, well, Hillary's not going to Italian 90, I'm going. So, I mean, what's well, that I'd about if, if nothing else? No, yeah, no, I, no, I, I, I take that point completely, Joe. And I, I wouldn't want to overstate or understate the, the sort of the political importance of it. But you know, again, if you look at eighty-seven, June eighty-seven, you know, there's no elections on the on the horizon. Uh, really. There's always an election. Um, always an election on the well, horizon. Always an election, election, I suppose. And <laughs> um, nineteen ninety is different, certainly. Uh, but uh, you know, I think he was wise enough or a sort of um, maybe cynical enough himself to know that these things generally tended to be uh, somewhat uh, tangential really to political sure. uh, success. Because certainly when, you know, when, when elections came around, uh, people weren't worried about uh, how Ireland were doing uh, either in football or cycling or, yes, or yes. you know, how Kerry were doing in, in, in their chase for Sam. Uh, it was things like, uh, you know, the economy. Yeah. Well, I guess it sounds, I mean, everything we know of him, it sounds like being on the international stage would have appealed to him as well, you know. Well, very much Champs so, yeah. And, he, and hanging out with Jacques oh, Chirac in Paris, you know. Oh, yeah, exactly. And, you know, he, and he considered himself the equal uh, of people like Chirac and of Thatcher. Uh, he certainly would have had no... Uh, uh, you know, no, no hang-ups. Uh, you know, this is this explains the sort of not explains, but it was part of like him being immaculately dressed and 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 whatnot. Um, but he was uh, he was conscious of the of, of projecting our, of Ireland in a positive uh, way, and and did want to be associated with success. Yeah. I don't think there's any 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 doubt about uh, about that. Um, and Gary, and, uh, Gary, Gary, could I ask you as a matter of interest, because we, we, we look at all these things obviously in reverse. You know when he's, uh, well, uh, less so 87 Champs-Élysées because there probably aren't that many Irish people there, but you know Italia 90 when he's marching around the stadium with tricolour and waving at the fans and the economy's in the toilet and whatever controversies at this stage have attached themselves to how he are well known. Like, w- would the public have been absolutely at that stage wise to this and the media wise to this and there would have been a degree of here? This has nothing to do with you. Would you stop trying to share the limelight here? Go away. Or would they have been, I don't know, in a slightly more naive way, delighted to see Charles Hawley was there as well? Yeah, it's, it's, it's an interesting question, Joe, because I, I can't imagine uh, any political leader now getting the... No. A, having to start to the chutz back to do it, but B, getting the ovation uh, how he got. So he's not just, and if you look at the photographs, he's not just sort of hanging on to the coattails of the players or walking with uh, uh, with Jack Charlton. I, I think the photo in the book is actually one of him of, uh, on his own. Um, and he gets this tumultuous welcome. Now, you know, everyone's in relatively good form, of course. Um, disappointed with the result, but, you know, a great achievement to get to the, to get the quarterfinal of the World uh, Cup. And... Um, yeah, I mean, again, 1990, things are improving with the in the economy, certainly, uh, and how he would have expected to win the, the presidential election of a few months uh, later. He, the on the international stage, he's had the, the great success with the uh, with the European presidency, which was not just hailed here in Ireland, but I think was seen across mm. Europe as a, a pretty successful uh, presidency, showcasing the sort of uh, the best of uh, the best of Ireland. Um, remember also, the, of course, the troubles are. Are still ongoing in uh, in Northern Ireland, um, and so he was, I think, conscious certainly of the feel good factor and uh, yeah. wanted to be associated with. It. But also, then you know, he does get a very uh, very good reception. Well, we uh, just we, we we put up the picture, and you can see like he's basking in it. This is not a a man being booed by the crowd, and the photographers are no, all not around at him. All. If anyone's listening, we just put the pictures up there. So I just can't imagine. Uh, Michal Martin, well, I don't think Neil Martin would quite have the ego to do it, but I, I can't imagine Neil Martin or Leo Radker or however many T-shirts you want to go back from now getting that kind of reaction if they pitched up and walked around on their own after the Irish team. It just wouldn't happen, no, so it's, it's, no, it's really it interesting. 
But even at the time, I mean, the thing about hockey, of course, which I, I tried to bring out in the book, I mean, he was either the great villain uh, of Irish politics as, as he was to, to to anyone from the sort of the arms trial onward or to a certain group of people. Mm. And then some people really hailed him as a sort of a, uh, you know, a figure who had a sort of the common touch, notwithstanding the fact that he lived in this extraordinarily beautiful, uh, you know, Gandon design mansion in uh, uh, in Abbeville. I mean, the, the, the voters of sort of Dublin North East kept voting him in uh, with these huge, uh, huge majorities, and he would bring in people on his uh, uh, on his coattails. And a bit like his uh, uh, his protege Bertie Hearn, he did have the um, he did have the common uh, the common touch. Yeah. The other thing both of them had in common it was that they. Uh, they did have a genuine interest in in sport. Now, in hockey's instance, obviously there were there was football and the GA, and we talked about. But in horse racing, of course, then was probably his other great uh, his other great love. He owned a number of uh, of horses going back until from the nineteen sixties up until uh, un, un, until his retirement. And famously, his horse Flashing Steel won the nineteen ninety three Irish Grand National, I think, okay. um, and. Uh, and but horse racing didn't come cheap, and her, her, he. Well, this goes to the point about how his money. Yeah. Um. He was able to pay his bills because he had his checkbook, and people kept cashing his uh, his check. I, I itemize in the uh, in the in the book how much uh, uh, horse um, horse training fees uh, were. He had a number of horses with the famous trainer uh, Vincent O'Brien, and he was friendly with with O'Brien. Uh, he was friendly with lots of uh, lots of sporting uh, people, but he had a he had a strong affinity with. Uh, uh, with horse racing yeah answered. to bluntly and very bluntly and you'll have to excuse me here right but just to, for the purposes of time to bluntly sum up the career for people uh, like myself who wouldn't be naturally au fait with it or didn't live through it so 1960s a uh, very promising political career Minister for Justice Minister for Finance everything on the up 1970 yeah. 1970s, the arms trial, and then uh, much of the 70s is spent biding the time and, and yeah. uh, just hanging around Fianna Fáil until Jack Lynch and others uh, head off. And then leader from 1979 to 1992. And so the 80s is really his time and he's in yeah. and out of office. Uh, you in your book assert that in 1979, when he became Taoiseach, at that stage, he was a million pounds in debt. And there was yeah. almost like a face to face meeting with AIB. And there's a I'm not quoting him here, but there's a degree of, well, do you want me as your enemy? I mean, I mean, let's 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 stay oh, friends very here. Much so. Yeah. And no, no, so, very much so. Yeah, yeah he that, did. There's but, a very aggressive meeting with AIB. And it kind of goes to the heart of this contradiction because Hockey always claimed in the tribunals of the 1990s, the, the Moriarty Tribunal, that he um, he by the early 1960s or three decades earlier, he had handed over the sort of the running of his finances to uh, this character, this trainer yeah. who, who started off life as a, as a, a sort of a clerk in, in the firm Hockey Boland, which Hockey and his friend Harry Boland had set up in the in the 50s. But we do know certainly that two decades later, Hockey had a face-to-face -face meeting with AIB uh, because they were threatening to take off his uh, his checkbook. And unlike now in the sort of the era of revolution and whatnot, um, in those days you paid with your uh, your checkbook. Hockey kept cashing uh, or he kept writing checks, and the banks kept uh, kept cashing them yes. uh, for him. And the, the tribunal finds against him uh, in a, in a number of instances. His family strongly rejected that he got any money for a political sort of uh, favors done. And, and, and I write about this in the book, trying trying to weigh it up. Um, but certainly, you know, uh, I think part of the difficulty for Hockey in in retirement. I, I mean, I write in he went to Jack Lynch's funeral in 1999 in Cork and, and was booed. Um, you know, you, 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 you don't see booing really at, at a funeral. Uh, but how he was booed when he, when his Mercedes, his, his state-sponsored car, uh, was driving through the city on the way back to uh, uh, to Dublin. Mm. And, and the, the heart of that was, of course, the dispute with Lynch going back to uh, the arms trial, and also the fact that uh, all these revelations about his money, and also his affair with with Terry Keane that had become known the previous May, May, May of '99. Um, and so he was a very kind of a complex, uh, ambiguous. Uh, character yeah. and but he did have this fatal flaw with regards to the money uh, because he never thought for one minute that, that it would be uncovered and it's uncovered because of this family dispute in the uh, uh, in the Dunn the Dunn family yeah and so uh, the question I was kind of getting around to 1979 a million in debt AIB yeah. you know you, you still want me as a friend I mean I don't, don't make me an enemy and so they continue to honour the checkbook and that's how he spends his money and you know, there's, yeah. he says things like, well, the swimming pool I put into my house is the best money I ever spent. And Indeed, there's, yeah. <laughs> there's the money on the art and the clothes and the island and whatever you care to mention, and the, the, wine, the, hor yeah, the horse yeah. racing, I guess. So 
see, my memory, I'm of an age where my memory of Hahi is an old man walking out of the tribunals. And yeah. he's, he's in complete ruin. His reputation is, sure. beyond, is beyond redemption, I would say. Yeah. So, oh, very much so, yeah. 1980s in particular, when he's Taoiseach and, and whatever about the 1970s as well, when I'm sure he was still living well into early 90s. Uh, was it the case, Gary, because I'm asking this in the context of even him being celebrated at Italia 90, was it the case that everybody, maybe it wasn't being printed in newspapers or maybe it was, but everybody in Ireland would have said his lifestyle doesn't add up, he's getting money he shouldn't be getting from somewhere, something about this guy uh, absolutely stinks on that front, but we're just going to let it pass because maybe this is what the elite do or this is what politicians do. Or was this a big surprise to a cohort of the Irish public when it when it did fully emerge? Yeah, I think perhaps a little bit of both. I mean, certainly journalists like Vincent Brown for decades had been chasing after the, the source of uh, of Hahi's money. Um, the, the speculation was that he had done a variety of land deals, or w- 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 which he did, certainly in the 1960s, and had made uh, made a lot of money, invested it wisely. And he famously then said in, in 79, when he was asked about his wealth, um, that uh, he, asked, he told the journalist, don't necessarily assume I'm a wealthy man, which was actually true. said sort of yeah. sardonically, but it was uh, it was true. Um, so so, when, so certain- when is a matter of interest, like th- that he was a million quid in debt in 79, when does all that emerge? That doesn't emerge until the tribunals. Yeah, that okay. doesn't emerge until okay. the mid nineteen, the mid and the, the first few years of his retirement are very sedate, too sedate for him in one way. Um, he's diagnosed with cancer in ninety four, but he, um, you know, they're, they're quiet. He plays with his grandchildren, and then it all goes spectacularly wrong in ninety six. 97 when the, the the Dunn family saga comes out and then it's the, the discovery of how his monies uh, the, the state start go, goes after him in terms of in, in the guise of the uh, the Moriarty uh, tribune and he you're quite right Joy he is utterly uh, ruined his and you know I'm not trying to um you know to uh, to restore his reputation or anything in this book I just present the evidence uh, as, I, as I as I find it and I try to uh, I try to assess it. but he is then he is basically to all intents and purposes ruined. He spends the last few years of his life uh, in Abbeville as, as a virtual recluse. His health gets uh, worse and he eventually dies at the age of 80 in June of uh, of 2006. But not only then, so if I could just say, not, it wasn't just the money, of course. Then there was the, the affair with, with, with Terry Keane. And that was that's an interesting story in itself because, it, you know, people would say to me, oh, everybody in Dublin or, or, or everybody knew that how he was having an affair with Terry Keane. She wrote about it in the Keane Age and whatever. Um, but the fact is not Everyone didn't know. I mean, not everybody read the Sunday Independent, and not ev- not everybody moved in sort of the social, the glitzier social circles of uh, uh, of Dublin. And I know this came as a tremendous shock to uh, to many Fianna Fáilers all around the country uh, when uh, when Terry Keane famously went on the Late Date Show with mm-hmm. uh, with Gay Byrne in May of '99, a night that hockey uh, to his discredit uh, went for dinner with his wife Maureen and and her friends Arthur Gibney and his wife uh, and didn't tell Maureen uh, knowing full well that uh, that Terry Keane was going on the show because he had met her the previous day uh, in Le Coq Hardy the restaurant and asked her not to do it um, but, uh, but she wasn't for turning and uh, you know it was uh, that was probably finished him off in terms of his uh, his reputation with many particularly in, uh, in Fianna Fáil Right if you separate all the scandal, quote unquote the scandal, which I don't think you can ultimately, but if you just for a second park it, there are yeah. some politicians who just want to be in power because it's fun to be in power. You know, I sort of get that deal off Boris. He just wants to be in power. He doesn't know what to do with it, but he likes being in power. <laughs> yeah. uh, was Hahi, in your view, of that ilk or did he have genuine vision and did he have a talent for policy and legislation because I know he boasted early on in life about a, a, a genuinely he thought great financial and economic intellect so just as a politician did he have talent and I don't just mean a talent for getting into power well, he did. He, he had tremendous talent and, and ability. I mean, so first of all, he was just very, a very smart person. Yeah. I mean, he came first in the Dublin scholarship exam of 500 boys in 1938. Um, and the idea then was that allowed him to go to secondary school. This is before free secondary education. Uh, his, uh, they were lived in very straitened circumstances in uh in Belton Park Road in, in Donny Carney. So he, he had a natural uh, intelligence. He certainly, UCD is a formative influence when he goes there. Uh, again, he's not, uh, he, he's not 
sort of confidence there. Uh, he does very well. He gets a first class degree. He goes into the sort of uh, the accountancy business into Dublin uh, society. And then he works his way up in Fianna Fáil. He's a serial loser. He loses four times before he gets in in 1957. But he's he's in the cabinet within basically four years, uh, promoted by his father-in-law, Sean Lamass. Um, and maybe there's a little bit of family ties going on there, but there's also great talent justice, I mean, a lot of people would, would have heard maybe of, of the Succession Act, but that was a really reforming piece of legislation because it ensured that uh, widows couldn't be written out of uh, out, 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 out of wills. Mm. Um, so that was a really reforming piece of legislation. He's in charge of the abolition of the death penalty, although it stays on the book for capital murders right into the 1980s. So there's a lot uh, going on. Uh, he considers running for the leadership in, in 66, doesn't George Colley challenges Lynch. Lynch ultimately wins. Hyde then is, you know, he's one stop away from the leadership. Um, and then it all goes spectacularly wrong during the uh, uh, the arms trial and then you're into the sort of poverty of the 1970s. But Power certainly, so, so he is very talented. He's very able. He gets a lot done. Um, but he is very much driven by, by Power. I mean, I think I write in the last paragraph of the book that how he was, you know, Power was a sort of a, an aphrodisiac for him. He was very, he hated being in opposition. He hated the 1980s. Um, it, 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 his opposition to the Anglo-Irish Agreement was a sort of a visceral reaction that he was in opposition and he didn't get it done. Uh, so he wanted to be in power and he, and he was ruthless as a, as a politician. Mm. And there was a lot of heaves in, uh, in Fianna Fáil with Daisy O'Malley, uh, uh, Martin O'Donoghue, uh, George Colley. Um, you know, he makes bitter enemies, uh, but he's also has great, uh, great devotion from, uh, uh, from people. So I would say, I mean, it is difficult certainly to divorce the sort of uh, the, 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 the private and the public like Waldo, how he was able to do what I think he was kind of able to compartmentalize the different facets of his, uh, uh, of his life, but he very much wanted to be in uh, in power. I mean, unquestionably, he saw uh, the, the office of Taoiseach as a place where he wanted to be and wanted to get things uh, things done. He's a relatively unsuccessful Taoiseach in his first uh, two attempts, 1789, 81, and then 1982. People would have heard of the sort of the Gobu stuff, um, the Sean Doherty tapes, which come back to haunt them a decade later, but certainly 87 to 92, um, sort of the four years he's, he's in power there. Uh, a lot gets done. You, you do have the sort of beginnings of the, of the, the Celtic Tiger. Um, you have the opening up of the economy and, and things get uh, get a lot better. Social partnership, he he drives that, uh, which you know has its critics, but certainly gave macroeconomic stability to the, uh, the state. And what he was very keen to do, Joan, and I think this goes back to what we talked about at the beginning, when Stephen wrote in Italian 90, um, he wanted to restore international confidence uh, in Ireland. Uh, interest rates were extraordinarily high in the 80s. Emigration was a desperate, you know, uh, blight on the uh, on the country, and people were not willing to invest uh, in Ireland. And Hockey, to be fair, I think leads two governments, 87 to 89, and then with the PDs, 89 to 92, that do. Um, begin the uh, the restoration of the uh, the country's international uh, reputation which is yeah. very important in relation to things like you know bond yields and you know and esoteric stuff like that but which are which are important for uh, for the ordinary citizens and, and how he did have this connection I think to ordinary uh, people and you know he was able to talk to them about horse racing uh, about the dubs uh, about Kerry um, a bit like Bertie was able to talk to ordinary people like uh, about Man United I mean yeah. and sometimes I think there's a, a kind of a snobbery uh, in relation to how p- your people consider politicians but you know politicians are mostly I think people like me and you who are interested in you know many things and and, and sport is uh, is one of them uh, and it's a kind of a dominant uh, psyche of the uh, of the Irish condition and I think how he uh, how he not only recognised it, but I think he uh, he kind of felt it. You said there he was very good at being able to compartmentalise things, so maybe that's just the answer here to the question I was going to ask. But back to the money for <laughs> like we detour away from the money, but then you come back to the money because it's just so yeah. indelibly so, associated with him, unfortunately indeed. for him. So the, yeah. the the million in debt, and then the AIB and the checkbooks, and then the huge amounts of money given by privately from the likes of a Ben Dunn where it's, you know, colossal sums of money which, uh, you know, I think you make the point and he argues it was for no political favour but I think very obviously people would feel it's an inappropriate thing to happen. Do yeah, for, 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 for a Taoiseach to be sort of uh, indebted to yeah, that degree. It's not, it's, yeah, not, yeah. it's not best practice uh, to, no. put it, to put it mildly. So yeah. was he not 
I guess, I, monumentally worried at all times that all of this was just going to blow up, his, up in, in his face and to come out and like why put himself in that position why be so stupid to put yourself in this position like this is the kind of I don't know is it a fatal flaw or something Shakespearean or whatever but there's, no, some, no, there's it, something there which is kind of hard to get your head around for someone so smart and capable to have made yeah, such a, a of, mess of it No there's there's a bit of a kink there you know I, I lived with uh, for the last sort of seven or eight years <laughs> pretty much every day uh, thinking about this uh, about this book and and that was one of the things that uh, bothered me or puzzled me the uh, uh, with all this going along in the in the background you know and uh, I think part of him kind of uh, decided just to park it away in the expectation it, it never would uh, uh, would come out okay. I mean the people that uh, the people that they got the money from, so people like uh, like Ben Dumbrell, also someone like Dermot Desmond, who went to the tribunal and said that he gave hockey, I think it was something over a million, but he would happily have given them a million more. Uh, I interviewed Dermot Desmond about this book a few years ago, and he told me that as well that he uh, uh, just, that he um, just because he would rate, have given because more. he rated hockey as a politician, rated as hockey, a person. Yeah, there's a right. there's an episode where he goes to see hockey before the eighty seven election. Uh, saying this is what the, the government needs to do and how he says well that's easy for you to do living in your sort of uh, your grand house in Aylesby Road or, or whatever it was but what about the people in Donny Carney and Rohini and and, uh, and what not uh, but yeah Desmond rated uh, uh, rated hockey. Now, the IFSC, he had pitched that to the, the previous Fine Gael Labour government and they didn't uh, buy it. Hockey went for it, bullheadedly. Uh, you know, I, I write of a memo where he basically orders the, uh, uh, the committee to succeed, uh, the sort of committee overseeing the IFSC. He basically says, you know, the, the country is uh, relying on you. And later on, I write in the book about um, uh, how he was a guest of Desmond's at uh, at the, the Scottish Cup final where Glasgow Celtic uh, beat Air G in the uh, 95, I think. Uh, not just, uh, you know, and hockey says, you know, we had a great day out. They fly over back in the one uh, the one day. But there, there's a kink in hockey, certainly. There's another yeah. example I would give, Joe. He buys uh, Inis Vickalon, £25,000 in 1974. And he's about £600,000 in debt uh, at that stage. I right. mean, and I said to myself, you know, <laughs> why would one do this? And of course, one part of it is because you know, he they didn't feel that uh, these debts would be uh, called, would be in. called in, perhaps, yeah. um, and that he had a very strong uh, future. This is just before he's brought back to the Fianna Fáil uh, front bench. But again, I think to, you know, to, to most people uh, listening to us tonight, uh, it's just it's just a bit odd, really. And there is a mm. kink there, certainly. Mm. Um, and how he was... You know, he was there no way about it. He was disgraced when the uh, when these revelations came. I mean, we haven't talked about the Brian Lenehan one. He was very close at the Lenehan. The one time he would get really upset at the tribunal, um, you know, his his answers and because he had been on trial a couple of decades earlier with his liberty at stake, his answers always tended to be short and clipped. But he, you know, and then he, he has memory problems at the tribunal because uh, he's just getting older and, and he's quite sick um, and his evidence is curtailed. Uh, but he, the one time he gets upset is where he's challenged about the the Lenihan money. So you know we we know that how he um, that the money to, to Lenihan got his treatment, got his liver uh, operation in the, in the um, in the Mayo Clinic in Minnesota. Um, but the remainder of the money went to Hockey, basically, uh, even though it was given for Lenehan's uh, treatment. And Hockey got very upset when he was uh, challenged about this at the uh, at the tribunal. But again, most people, you know, who looked at that episode would say that, uh, you know, that Hockey really was um, acted perhaps quite shamefully in keeping the money that was given uh, uh, for Lenehan. But his view was that uh, you know the Lenehans got their. Uh, uh, Brian Lennon got his operation. Yeah. Um, it's a murky tale. I don't think it does our hockey sort of any uh, any credit. But he he said to the to the judge and to the um, uh, the state's team that uh, you know Lennon was my closest and dearest friend. And I kind of how dare you, uh, you know, uh, question my motives? I suppose. Okay. Is a good way of putting it. Yeah. Well, listen. Thanks so much for coming on and talking to us about all that hockey. Is the Name of the new book. It's a book. great pleasure, Joe. Thanks for having no, me. I really uh, I've been listening for a year. I think I was on once before talking about the uh, the Confederate flag at uh, Cork. Oh yeah, so, yeah, something yeah, yeah. I feel very strongly about. Well, but hopefully no, we're it's not. A great ho- pleasure. Yeah. Hopefully we're not talking about the Confederate flag anytime soon over the summer. And I that's, would, I've that's hoped, that. Yeah.